Hello, Internet. Danny Benton here with a long overdue third installment in my video series covering my personal, nearly lifelong struggle with Lyme disease and Lyme disease treatment. Uh, this is a video I've been putting off for a little too long, um, and I would like to try and make this uh, like my second video like a conversation um, so I don't have a long script written out so please bear with me I just have my notes here about the things that I would like to cover um, and I'm going to start with a very brief recap of my history with Lyme disease up until uh, my previous video so first of all I'm going to cover this recap very briefly. This is 30 years smushed down into a few minutes. So um, everything that I mention in this recap is going to be covered in great detail in my previous videos. The first one was an hour long and the second one was 45 minutes. I know that's a really long video for someone to watch. Um, so I'm not going to tell you to go back and watch those unless something that I mention during this recap is something that you need more information about, then by all means, yes, please go watch that video and also please feel free to ask me any sorts of questions if you are someone who is going through this treatment or this struggle for yourself. So to begin, um, I was bit by a tick in Oregon in 1991 when I was seven years old. Um, the disease was allowed to get a strong stranglehold on my body, primarily because um, the doctors that my parents took me to at that time for many, many months denied treatment because the CDC said that Lyme disease was not in Oregon and I had not been outside of Oregon, therefore it was impossible for me to have Lyme disease. And one of them went so far as to say that I was actually faking it. I was a very smart girl and I was trying to get out of school. So um, there's a lot to cover just, just in that area alone. Um, but I'm not going to go into all of those details here. I went into that in great detail in my first video. Um, the treatments that I underwent as a child uh, when I was finally given a clinical diagnosis of Lyme disease by a doctor who was able to see past the fact that the CDC does not recognize at that time Lyme disease was in Oregon. Um, he put me on antibiotics. The only one I remember because I was a child is um, zithromycin. I know there were a few others but that doctor was not allowed to prescribe antibiotics long enough to actually cure Lyme at that time. Um, it did eventually go into remission when I was in the sixth grade. Um, so treatment included sporadic antibiotics when we could get them, either from that doctor or um, when my dad went down to Mexico and actually smuggle antibiotics back across the border for me. Um, in addition to that, my parents did a lot of research into alternative treatments. Um, so I remember I was on uh, blue-green algae colloidal silver, and my dad actually bought and built a uh, sauna so I could do heat therapy. And he also built his own Rife machine. It's R-I-F-E machine um, that does electromagnetic therapy. Um, after Lyme went into, the, into remission when I was in the sixth grade, I had a period of time where I only had um, a handful of symptoms. And because I was sick when I was so young, I convinced myself that a lot of these symptoms that I had my entire life since then were normal. I didn't really know any different being sick when I was seven years old. Um, a lot of the things like insomnia, um, the uh, night sweats, uh, feet on fire, um, a lot of those things I lived with my entire life because I was in such denial that I still had Lyme disease. 
So fast forward to the information that I covered in my second video. Um, Lyme came back with a vengeance when I was an adult. Um, I got a positive Lyme test in my mid-20s, I guess, in March of 2018. And my doctor at the time, who was a naturopath, said that she didn't know enough about Lyme, especially somebody who had had it for, you know, 20 plus years at that time. Um, so she referred me to a, a LLMD, which is a Lyme literate medical doctor, which basically just means a doctor who understands that Lyme disease is not what the CDC says it is, treatment is not what the CDC says it is, and most of these LLMDs honestly are this understanding because they have had Lyme disease themselves, so a high percentage of LLMDs um, have actually had their own battle with Lyme disease. My first appointment with my LLMD was in June of 2018. And this is the only portion of this video that I am actually going to switch over and um, sort of read from a script just because I don't want to mess up all any details of the treatment plan. And we had a lot of different treatment plans and thought processes over the course of the few years that we were working with that doctor. Um, so in June of 2018, when I brought him my positive Lyme test that I had received in March of 2018, um, in addition to that, he gave me a clinical diagnosis of Bartonella and Babesia, which are two of the most common uh, tick-borne co-infections along with Lyme disease. And very briefly, the way he explained it is that you want to knock out one illness at a time. So we start with the easiest to treat and go to the most difficult. And that also just uh, takes away the symptoms in layers. Um, so the easiest he said to treat is Babesia, which we did with a uh, what he called a parasite cleanse. Um, it included, it was a, a mix of five medications. It was four antiparasitics and one anti-malarial. Um, the cost of the parasite cleanse, uh, was going to be something like $10,000, but I managed to find them, um, from a totally legal way to order medications from outside of the United States using a company called Canada Pharmacy Online. So the parasite portion, the parasite cleanse portion of my treatment, um, was only a few hundred dollars. It included atovaquone, also known as malarone, which is an anti-malarial similar to what you've probably heard of, hydroxychloroquine. Um, this was the big one to wipe out Babesia, and I took 250 milligrams, two pills, twice a day for about six months. The parasite cleanse also included albenza for 20 days, ivermectin for eight days, biltricide, for six days and Alenia for 60 days. And after that cleanse was over, he was um, pretty confident that we had wiped out Babesia, which left us with Lyme and Bartonella. For Lyme disease, um, he very closely followed the antibiotic protocol that Dr. Horowitz outlines in his book, I believe it's called Why Can't I Get Better? Dr. Horowitz is a very well-known um, Lyme doctor. And so I was pleased that uh, my LLMD followed Dr. Horowitz's uh, protocol quite closely. So various medications I was on was um, three antibiotics at a time. For most of the time, it was azithromycin, tinidazole, which was fluctuated with metronidazole, and minocycline, which was fluctuated with doxycycline. And he would make the fluctuation calls based on uh, my symptoms and that sort of thing. If I'd reached a plateau, he'd switch to a different antibiotic from the same family to sort of get us over that and um, continue, continue making improvements. In addition to the antibiotics, I um, was on a number of just general vitamins and supplements. 
Of course, I was on um, high-dose, wide-spectrum probiotics and prebiotics three times a day. Absolutely essential um, anytime you're on antibiotics, but especially when you're on antibiotics for uh, over two years. Also, um, because of the prolonged antibiotic use, I was on fluconazole, which um, helps with your body's internal yeast overgrowth, which antibiotics um, tend to help happen. I was on lactoferrin, which helps soften Lyme disease uh, spirochetes biofilm, and it sort of just gives the antibiotics a little bit of a boost. Uh, prenatal vitamins, I've always been on prenatal vitamins, um, even though we were wanting to try for a baby during our treatment, but of course we couldn't while I was on treatment, um, but prenatal vitamins are some of the best general vitamins that you can get anyways. I was on a high dose of 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3, and I've been on uh, NAC, which I uh, can't remember what NAC stands for, um, but it, interestingly it was in the news um, in 2020. Uh, Amazon and a lot of other um, supplement websites stopped carrying NAC, uh, claiming that it was used in like um, some sort of... Uh, eating disorders or something. Um, so Amazon stopped carrying all NAC. It's actually a really important um, supplement for your body as it's it's known as the precursor to glutathione, which uh, glutathione is a natural way to stimulate your body's uh, detox mechanisms. So NAC helps your body make glutathione, which helps you detox. So um, that is on my list of supplements. Um, while going to our LLMD, this was not uh, his idea, but an idea we brought to him, and he said, yes, it can't hurt. Um, we also were on um, Dr. Buner's herbal protocol from his book, um, Naturally Healing Lyme, or Healing Lyme Naturally. Um, it's also a well-known book that a lot of people use if they're completely reluctant to use antibiotics. Um, so Dr. Buner's herbal protocol involves uh, taking four herbs, cat's claw, andrographis, resveratrol, also known as Japanese knotweed, and astragalus. And because I have been fighting Lyme for so long, and uh, Lyme disease, among other things, um, just eats away all the collagen in your body, um, which is collagen you think of like a beauty thing, but uh, collagen uh, is really important for your body for other reasons. Um, so I started supplementing with Dr. Buner's um, Lyme collagen protocol, which includes uh, taking liquid silicone, alpha lipoic acid, glucosamine sulfate, and vitamin E with selenium. Um, that covers everything I did with the LLMD up to that point. Um, also, in addition to that, um, Evan and I started doing hair mineral analysis, um, which I'm, not, I'm just barely going to touch on this because it really needs its own entire video um, hair mineral analysis. We send um, a little bit of hair that's recently grown um, close to the skin, send it off to a lab for testing, and um, they're able to tell you um, on a mineral level what your body needs, what your body is getting rid of, um, all kinds of really, really useful information. Um, so we did our hair mineral analysis uh, through a company who um, we worked with a scientist who interprets our analysis, and we had monthly phone calls with him, and um, he gave us a whole list of supplements based exactly on what our body needs at that time. And then you retest periodically, uh, fairly regularly, and um, you know you see the changes and say, okay, well, these supplements 
allowed your body to start doing this and that's good and so now you're, you need these other supplements. Um, so we had basically a monthly um, phone call checkup with him and he would uh, adjust our supplements accordingly at that time. And it also includes a, um, a really strict diet that we started at this point, um, which again, I'm not really going to go into it. I should do a whole other video on hair mineral analysis at some point. Um, but we mostly just um, at this time started following the diet, which is um, as many steamed root vegetables, um, which are very, very mineral dense. Um, and today's population and today's diet is very, very mineral lacking. So you eat as much of your meals as you can, um, super mineral dense vegetables, and then you supplement that with um, healthy meats, uh, fish, uh, sardines, and um, lamb as much as possible. Um, so that covers the hair mineral analysis. And all of this, I'll just take a minute to say, um, all of this was out of pocket. Um, so for a few short months, uh, I met the requirements to be on Medicaid, and that covered my Lyme test, which I'm very thankful for. Um, and it covered some of my antibiotics, but I was so, so sick when I first started treatment. And Medicaid was so, so awful for... Um, just not approving things. So it was just an insane amount of stress every single time I went to the pharmacy to fill prescriptions, which was every two weeks. I was constantly on the phone with Medicaid saying, yes, this is for Lyme disease. Yes, I need a refill. Yes, you know, uh, it's from a doctor. Like they just had all these questions. Like Lyme is just so misunderstood um, that they, Medicaid just didn't want to cover anything. They did cover a lot of my prescriptions um, for the few months that I was on it, which was nice to only have to pay for, you know, it was like, it was a range of $1 to $3 each time I got a prescription filled for the that few months that I was on Medicaid. But, um, <laughs> but it like almost wasn't worth it because of the fight, you know? When I'm so sick and I just I couldn't handle just the hour-long phone calls every two weeks arguing with someone that yes I actually need this prescription filled that I'm trying to get filled um, so I wrote this out recently um, for a relative who is also going through uh, a lengthy uh, Lyme treatment and I made a note that antibiotics were the most expensive part of the treatment and the longest treatment years it's not months it's years um, once Lyme gets to the chronic stage I don't know because of the way that I did I did three different treatments together I don't know if antibiotics would have been effective on their own and when I started antibiotics I noticed slow and steady improvement the herbs uh, Dr. Buhner's herbal protocol was less expensive than antibiotics but it wasn't cheap it was less time than antibiotics but not super short it was still over a year and I also don't know if the herbs would have been effective on their own because I took them in tandem with the antibiotics however when I went on Dr. Buhner's herbal protocol I did notice improvement within a few weeks um, two weeks after I started taking them I was able to get out of bed and do the dishes and at that point that was like mind-blowing um, and that brings me to the next portion that I want to talk about which is disulfiram disulfiram is hands down the reason I am out of bed today disulfiram is the reason that I believe that my Lyme disease is gone or at least well into remission again. I'm hesitant to say that it's gone, but disulfiram is the reason that I have a very short list of symptoms today instead of a laundry list. Um, disulfiram is the least expensive. It's the least time commitment. It's about four to six months once you reach your target dose 
that doesn't include your tapering up or your tapering down, which, as I will mention in a moment, is very, very, very important. Um, I can't say for certain that disulfiram would have been effective on its own because, again, I was taking it in tandem with the antibiotics and with the herbal treatment, but based on what I read from other people in the disulfiram support groups and based on um, what my doctor, my LLMD said that he had heard from other doctors testing out disulfiram treatments, and of course, based on uh, the reason that we're using disulfiram, which is actually a drug designed to treat alcoholism, um, the reason so many Lyme disease patients are using disulfiram for treatment, that disulfiram is in some places on permanent back order and you can't even get them from the pharmacies. I could not get disulfiram from an American pharmacy. Again, I used um, Canada Pharmacy online, which actually I was... Uh, ordered disulfiram from Europe, it shipped to Canada, and then it shipped to me. Um, so based on um, other long-suffering Lyme patients' results with disulfiram, I would say it's plausible that um, disulfiram could have gotten me to where I am today uh, without taking it in tandem with the antibiotics and the herbs. However, because I didn't take disulfiram on its own, I can't say that with 100% certainty. Um, like the herbs, I noticed improvement on disulfiram with a few weeks, and um, it pretty much, there were some plateaus, but it was pretty much just a slow and steady upward trajectory once I started disulfiram. So, but there are um, some major cons to disulfiram, which um, I'm going to go into here. So, let's see. I'm done with my... The pros are obviously that it's affordable, it's a shorter treatment time, and it is almost certainly the reason that I am well today. Um, it is not recognized by the CDC for Lyme disease treatment. Um, it is an approved drug for alcoholism treatment for alcoholics. Um, first important note is that uh, if you are a Lyme patient and you're researching disulfiram, 99% of the information that you're going to find online is um, the way that disulfiram responds in people's bodies with alcoholism and it's very, very, very different than the way that disulfiram, uh, that Lyme disease patients respond to disulfiram. Um, because when alcoholics take it, all it does is it makes it so you get violently sick if you have a drop of alcohol. So you can hold yourself accountable by taking disulfiram and then you can't drink. So, but with Lyme disease, when you take it, you're killing spirochetes. And most people who have Lyme, by the time you get to the point where you're like, oh, I'm going to try anything, I'm going to try disulfiram, uh, you're probably pretty sick. And so when you start taking disulfiram, you're going to be killing a lot of spirochetes. So that's the first important thing to keep in mind is that when you're reading about it, um, because it is fairly new um, for Lyme disease treatment in the past few years. Um, first of all, there's not a lot of information out there except through like Lyme disease Facebook disulfiram support groups. Um, some doctors by this point have a history of treating patients with it. When I read about disulfiram just from like a Lyme disease email that I get, and I was so sick and I read about it and then I just sort of dismissed it. Like I think I was just so sick that I just wasn't thinking. And um, Evan was doing all of my uh, treatment research. And so like I just sort of thought that he was going to read about it too. And then I mentioned it to him a few months later and I was like, well, did you remember reading about disulfiram? or that, I probably didn't remember the name, I said, did you remember reading about that medication for alcoholics that's treating Lyme? Like, 
what have you found out about looking into that? And he was like, what? <laughs> like, I hadn't mentioned it to him. So, you know, he, he I could have started this process a couple of months earlier had, uh, had I been cognizant enough to actually mention it to him. Just keep that in mind when you are looking it up. If you are a Lyme patient and you're considering disulfiram, there's not a lot of information out there. And we had to do this research we had to say, okay, this is what people are doing. There's a lot of documentation in this. Um, uh, there was one very good disulfiram treatment support group on Facebook um, that has uh, some studies and um, dosing information based on weight. And so we took that information to my LLMD and said, can we try this? And he said, you know, Yes, he said, I haven't, he personally hadn't treated anyone with disulfiram yet, but he had been hearing some very interesting things about it. So he said, yeah, go ahead. And um, he took the information and read it. He didn't give me a, a prescription immediately. He wanted to do a little bit more research and um, uh, ended up saying, yes, you know, what you presented me with here is... Uh, how I would also, based on all of this information, um, advise you to proceed. And so we started with disulfiram. So moving through the cons of disulfiram and the things to be cautious with is, um, first of all, the most obvious is uh, because it is a medication that does not allow your body to process alcohol and makes you violently ill if you drink alcohol, you have to watch your diet. Um, you obviously cannot drink alcohol during treatment or anything that includes alcohol, anything that was cooked with alcohol, or anything that your body digests as an alcohol, um, such as vinegar, among other things. So I couldn't eat pickles. We were pickle makers, and I couldn't eat pickles. Uh, most um, you know, uh, bottled salad dressings are going to have vinegar in them. Um, so, uh, and again, I was so sick at that time that I was really relying on Evan to uh, just give me a diet to eat, tell me what I can and can't eat, get anything that I can't eat out of the fridge because I don't have the mental capacity to think about this every time I go to the fridge or the cupboard. Um, so you have to watch your diet. And um, at one point, we were a few months into treatment, and uh, a really surprising thing came up that I, that neither one of us had thought about beforehand. And um, disulfiram makes it so your body can't digest alcohol properly, but it also makes it so other things can build up in your body, and it. I don't really know the, the science behind it, but one of those things is copper. And come to find out that uh, one of the um, vitamins that I was on had a tiny amount of copper in it. But what really got me was cashew butter. Um, Evan got a deal on cashew butter, and so uh, I think we'd had it in the cupboard for like three days. And I'd just gone in and like snacked on some cashew butter in the afternoons because I was too sick to cook. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do anything while Evan was at work. And uh, after a couple of days of the copper from the cashew butter combined with the tiny amount of copper in my supplements, um, I had a buildup of copper in my brain. And... Um, it felt like I was on drugs, like I was just so sick, but I also felt like completely disconnected from my body, like I had tunnel vision, and um, I, I don't know how to explain it except to say that I felt like I was on drugs, like it it really, really threw me for a loop. Somehow, Evan figured it out. He, I don't know, it, how he connected the dots to this, you know, half-empty jar of cashew butter and the disulfiram, and 
it causing um, buildups of things in your body. I don't know how he put it together, but once he figured it out, he um, looked online for things that can help you flush copper. And he went to the store and he got me just on a copper detox. And it was about 18 hours later, I felt mostly better. Um, and within three days, I was back to normal. Um, so what sort of scares me about that is there's a friend of mine um, from Oregon who is also starting a disulfiram treatment. And uh, it sounds like she's going to a really good doctor who really knows what they're doing and starting from the ground and just sort of uh, making sure that her body is in a state to be able to detox well enough before starting treatment. And um, her doctor didn't mention anything about diet to her. So that's like, whoa, really? Like, that's the biggest thing you have to watch out for with disulfiram. Um, so definitely be cautious of that. Um, hopefully, if, if you're going through a disulfiram treatment, you have an outside person who can really monitor um, your diet as well as the next part that I'm going to get into, which is mental health. Okay, so it is very, very, very important that when you are starting titrating up and when you're ending and titrating down, that you go very, very slow, painfully slow. It is not something you can just start and stop. It is known to induce mental issues and mania, okay? I came off of disulfiram too quickly, and for two months, I lost it, okay? So, remember while I'm telling you this, that disulfiram is the reason that I'm out of bed today, and I 100% stand behind that but I literally had a mental breakdown for two months after I was well okay so I'm on disulfiram slowly getting better you know energy is always really low it was low the entire time I was on treatment um, because my body was just fighting so hard that um, even though I it, it was really hard to explain during the treatment how I was like, I'm feeling better, but I cannot get out of bed. Like, I am exhausted. Like, um, somehow, I, I couldn't put it into words, and I still can't put it into words today, but it was a feeling of, I feel like I'm not as sick, but... I feel more exhausted. And it's really just because my body was working to fight a disease that had been building up for 30 years. So um, that's understandable. Moving on to the mental breakdown. Um, so I came off disulfiram too quickly. I did not heed the warnings to go excruciatingly slow when coming off of it. I don't remember why. You know, I, I wanted to get off disulfiram first so then I could stop the herbs and then I could stop the antibiotics. And I didn't want to be on treatment anymore. We really, really wanted to um, start having a baby and coming off of treatment was a requirement for that. And I felt better. So I rushed it. I rushed it. I came off fast and... I was depressed to the point of being, not being suicidal, but questioning the meaning of life. You know, like I was just, why am I here? What are we doing? I was so paranoid. I thought that the feds were going to come to my house because like maybe one of my write-offs for my taxes for my photography last year was 
not recorded appropriately and uh you know i thought we were gonna have to declare bankruptcy for some reason like i just i had all of these crazy things in my head and i was so stressed out about our chickens i we had a flock of eight leghorns and I was just, I thought they were all going to die. Like, I thought that I couldn't take care of them. And the feeling of responsibility of having to go out there and feed them in the mornings was so heavy on my mind that I thought my chickens were going to die. So I gave away um, six of my eight leghorns at that time. And... Uh, like, I was just nuts. Thank God I didn't have a lot of work going on at this time because of the pandemic, you know, uh, which um, is actually the reason that um, I was able to go fully into the disulfiram treatment. Um, March 2020 hit. I had all my weddings canceled for the rest of the year. We're like, all right, we're diving into this treatment right now. Um, so I actually very thankful for that. Um, and I'm also very thankful that I still hardly had any work during this two months of mania post disulfiram treatment. So well from Lyme healed, at least in deep remission, if not fully cured, but I came off that treatment too fast and it really, really knocked me for the loop. And it was two months. Um, looking back at my journal, uh, it was, it was two months from when the psychosis set in to when I could finally say, okay, I'm healed from Lyme and now I'm healed from this post I sell for amnesia. Um, so that's weird. And I know that's a weird story. And, you know, some people are going to hear that and just tune out and be like, you know, I don't know, like, maybe some people are going to hear that and think that, you know, my story is less credible, or the treatment plans that I went through are like, you know, they're going to click and, you know, move on to something else. And, you know, I admit that it sounds weird. Um, but just learn from my mistakes, and also from my victories, that uh, I did not heed the warning about coming off disulfiram slow enough, but I am out of bed today, and I would not be otherwise. So I ended disulfiram in September of 2020, and I ended antibiotics in November of 2020. So beginning of November. So September and October of 2020, I was out of my mind. Um, by beginning of November, 2020, the, uh, my LLMD was confident enough to let me do a test. Um, so we didn't actually, it, it's really hard to test for Lyme at the end of treatment because the tests, uh, have so many, um, false negatives that you don't really want to rely on a Lyme test to say that you don't have Lyme anymore. So my doctor, my LLMD suggested something pretty ingenious in that he said, okay, um, Lyme disease spirochetes, when you give them a huge pulse of antibiotics, um, are going to die off in mass numbers. And then you're going to have what's called a Herxheimer reaction. I've spoken about this before. Um, a Herxheimer reaction is where you get more sick because your body can't detox all the dead bacteria inside of you. So he said, what we're going to do is we're going to do a three-day huge pulse of antibiotics. And if you feel sick, we'll know that that's a Herxheimer and you have more bacteria inside you that needs fought. And if you don't, well, that's a pretty good sign without having an actual test. That's a pretty good sign that 
the spirochetes are at least in very, very low numbers, if not completely gone. So that was beginning of November 2020. We did that test. I did not react. I did not have a Herxheimer. Um, so at that time, we stopped antibiotics and Dr. Buhner's herbal treatment. Um, I continued with the hair mineral analysis, many, many supplements, um, red light treatment, and we started trying for baby Benton in December 2020. So the first time we started trying, or we had been planning to start trying right after our wedding, um, which was in August of 2018, so that was over two years later, we were finally free from treatments um, and finally given a, a clean bill of health from the doctor to start trying for a baby. Uh, we are still continuing the hair mineral analysis and supplements to this day. Uh, however, I'm having difficulty getting some of the supplements here in Mexico, so we've scaled that back a little bit. Um, I ordered a lot of supplements prior to our move here, um, and I wish I'd ordered a lot more. I was really worried about showing up at the Mexico border and saying we're moving to Mexico and just having a trunk full of vitamins and supplements and just how weird that would look. Um, but if you know our experience moving to Mexico, we got waved on at the border. Nobody even spoke to us. Nobody looked at our passports. Nobody looked in our car. So I could have had like a year's worth of vitamins and supplements and totally wouldn't have been a problem. Um, so I wish I'd done that. Um, I've heard a lot of mixed reviews about um, shipping supplements into Mexico. They have a lot of... Um, restrictions on what is allowed as far as supplements and medication to be shipped across the border. Um, things here like prescriptions, if I needed, if I was still on treatment and needed prescriptions, it would be way, way, way easier to get those. They're just available at any corner pharmacy. Um, but the um, specific supplements that I need for the hair mineral analysis program um, aren't as easy to find, unfortunately. Um, so I believe it's safe to say at this point that Lyme and Babesia are gone, or in such low numbers that I am once again in remission. And it's possible based on my few continuing symptoms that I still have Bartonella um, or Lyme in a very weak state. But based on the antibiotic test that my doctor did in November of 2020 and not having a Herxheimer, um, I'm going to lean towards still having a light case of Bartonella. So in the future, we're considering doing um, another not recognized by the CDC treatment for Bartonella, which is methylene blue. Um, so that's a, that's a possible future treatment. My current symptoms are uh, muscle pain throughout my whole body. It's a very common Lyme thing. Uh, it's also very common with uh, anxiety and a lot of the coping mechanisms that I have that I'm going to talk about here in just a sec. Um, so my muscles hurt every day. Uh, some, sometimes if, you know, you just lay a hand on me, it hurts. Um, and it's not the kind of muscle pain that, you know, my husband is a massage therapist or was a massage therapist for, uh, going on 15 years. So, uh, it's not the kind of muscle pain that massage actually helps it because it hurts so bad. Um, I am Evan's worst massage client that he's ever had in his entire career. Uh, in addition to the muscle pain, I have um, much more easy to deal with insomnia issues. Um, I'm sleeping pretty well. 
compared to a lifetime of debilitating insomnia. The level of insomnia that I have now is... I can deal with it. Um, and most nights I sleep pretty good, which is just head and shoulders above my entire life from 1991. I, I've dealt with just crippling insomnia. Um, besides muscle pain and insomnia, the rest of my current symptoms are... Um, mental, um, anxiety, and um, I anger easily, uh, which are two late-stage Lyme symptoms. So also coping mechanisms. So this is where it's, this is another area that's sort of hard to figure out how to talk about. Um, when you're in as much pain as Lyme patients are in for your entire life and when you're such a young little girl so afraid and just feeling completely alone uh, it's just so traumatic you know um, at one point just afraid of everything and then you have to like bottle all that up in order to be brave enough to continue to go on there's just a lot of traumatic things you know um, I have PTSD of abandonment in addition to you know anxiety and um, unresolved trauma that I'm dealing with so And I'm only now able to, like, look back on the time period from 2018, early 2018 to late 2020 when I was so sick. Only now, here I am in Oaxaca, Mexico, and I'm dog sitting at a house that has eight dogs. We need to go on a 90 minute hike up the mountain every morning and I can do it. And it's only like in doing this hike that I'm like, do you remember when I couldn't like walk two blocks in the French Quarter to Evan? And so it's only in comparison of what I can do now that I'm able to release some of that denial and uh, false bravado that I had to have back then because I couldn't walk a couple of blocks at times. I couldn't go out, you know? I couldn't get out of bed, let alone go do anything. And now I'm taking eight dogs on a hike up the side of a mountain every morning at this house sit, you know, like... I am so thankful to God, to Evan, to my LLMD, all the way back to 1991 when my parents were fighting the doctors for me, you know. It's been a hell of a battle. And it's not, it's not fully over, but it's way more closer to the finish line. It's 30 years closer to the finish line than it, from the beginning. Um, and I guess that sort of brings me to the last thing that I want to talk about in this video, um, which is hopefully my final step of treatment. Um, I'm doing a program called DNRS. It stands for Dynamic Neural Retraining System. And um, 
basically it's a program to help rewire my brain to get past the uh, anxiety and the other um, mental symptoms that are still remaining from both Lyme and coping mechanisms. So very briefly, the way that your brain works, uh, current understanding of the way the brain works is um, your brain's very smart and it has what's called neural plasticity, which means that um, even as you're growing, not just you know when you're a toddler and your brain is developing, but our entire lives, our brain is adjusting to our lives. So the quote that sticks in my mind is neurons that fire together, wire together. And what that means is that, you know, you have neural synapses firing through your brain and um, your brain is looking for the quickest and most convenient pathway to get from one area to the other. And so they basically build, starting with dirt roads, you know, if something's firing, it sort of builds a dirt road and then it digs a rut in that road. If you think about that thing a lot, and then you think about that thing a lot, a lot, and, and it eventually turns into a synapse highway, right? And so it's super easy for those brain areas to fire. And I apologize that I'm not probably using all of the correct words, but I hope that um, this is getting things across in a rudimentary way. Um, so when you have something really traumatic happen, um, or you're in denial about something, um, your brain, or, or you have Lyme disease and like the spirochetes are messing with the inner workings of your brain, um, they build alternate routes. So it needs to go from here to here, but it's got to go way over here before it can get here. And then eventually, you know, it, it's smart, so it has to keep doing that in order to function. Um, and it digs that rut, and it, the road gets bigger and bigger, and then that turns into a neural highway. Um, and then once that highway is built, it's, it's easy. So in my case, the Lyme bacteria is then taken away. It's no longer deteriorating, destroying my brain, but it already has its highways built. And so it's content with that, you know? Um, so, you know, trauma responses, uh, inappropriate reactions to things, irrational fears, anxiety, these neural pathways have been built and solidified but thanks to neural plasticity, even as an adult, your brain can be retrained. So DNRS is basically a um, daily exercise brain retraining program because fortunately, um, the way they build the neural pathways also works in reverse. And if you can get your brain to stop making connections that you don't want it to make, if the highway gets used less and less, it eventually goes back to being a smaller road and then a dirt path, and then it'll fizzle. And um, there's a, a lot of scientific evidence for this. I'm not going to go into it. I should probably do a whole video series on DNRS. Um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I started seeing improvement immediately. I have a long ways to go, but the improvement was like day one. Of doing this um, and building building new neural pathways and trying to get rid of the old pathways snipping those pathways um, so they're no longer used and um, and again that's completely possible thanks to neural plasticity so my hope is that this will be the last phase of my treatment is retraining my brain and one day I'm just gonna wake up and I'm not gonna be scared anymore and I'm not going to 
have those coping mechanisms just in there in the shadows waiting, you know. Um, anyone with trauma and PTSD is going to know what I mean, but um, this is... Talk therapy only gets you so far. Lyme disease treatment can only get you so far. And then you're left with your brain and... Um, This is doing it. I believe that this is doing it. Uh, the other thing I'm left with is working on balancing my hormones. Um, I just started seeing an acupuncturist here in Oaxaca um, who is trying to help get my hormones in balance um, for fertility and Hopefully, any day now, we're going to find out that we can have our first baby, Benton. Um, so please keep us in your thoughts. Keep us in your prayers. Thank you for listening. I feel like this was a little rambly, so um, I really hope that you were able to get something out of this video. Um, if you'd like to stay posted on our travels, uh, if you want to know why there's all these dogs around me and I'm in a weird house, not weird, it's beautiful, but, uh, you know, a different house, you know, every time we make a video, um, feel free to follow along. Uh, we are traveling through Mexico via house sitting, um, and you can... Follow our progress on our Benton Homestead Uprooted page and my Danny Benton photography. Um, I'm sharing a lot of travel blogs and, and uh, our house sitting adventures while we decide if we're going to start our next homestead here in Mexico or overseas in Japan. Um, so thank you again for watching and of course if you are a Lyme sufferer. Um, if you have any questions, if you think that I can help you in any way by sharing any more details about what I've been through, please do not hesitate to get in touch. You can leave a comment on any of the various channels or various platforms that this video is on. Um, you can email me, you can find me on Benton Homestead or Danny Benton Photography, you can email me through my photography website, you can find me on either of those social media pages. However you like, if you need to get in touch, if you think that there's any way that I could help you in any tiny bit, um, I have the free time to be able to do that at the moment and I would be very happy to help. So um, again, thank you for listening. Um, and I will keep posting periodic updates.